Hey everyone, I hope you've been having a great time at DevOps Loop so far. Welcome to one of the panel discussions. So I'm Tiffany Jernigan, I'm a developer advocate at VMware. So with us today, we, so actually first off, this panel, if you're making sure it's Kubernetes, whose idea was this? You can go to the Slack channel with the name panel discussion, Kubernetes, whose idea was this on the um, DevOps loop Slack. If you're not there already, you can ask questions in there. So you can also put the thing there saying, if you want it to be asked, if you want to actually ask it live yourself, um, you can put live there as well. And again, not all questions can be answered. We have a limited amount of time, but yeah, ask all the questions that you have and we'll try to get those answered for you. So we have several people on today. So we have Joe Beta, principal engineer at VMware, and one of the creators of Kubernetes. If you were paying, able to attend a little bit earlier, he gave a talk on evolving DevOps in the age of cloud native. We have Josh Rosso, staff architect at VMware. He gave the announcement for Tanzu Community Edition, which we just launched, if you see our some of our lovely shirts. Um, we have Brian Lyles, Principal Engineer of VMware. He gave a talk called No Plan is Worse Than a Bad Plan. We also have Andy Bergen. I, I'm pretty sure I just butchered that, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, he's a lead platform engineer at Sky Betting and Gaming and gave a talk on Blame DevOps, Shifting Left the Wrong Way. So, after all of this, uh, there will be DevOps party games that will happen at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Some of our panelists may have to drop early to get ready for that, but the conversation will continue after that as well. Um, so yeah, again, go to the Slack channel. You can just go to channels and click the plus and you can find the one for this and ask questions. And again, if you personally want to be asking them, just put that you tell us that you want it to be asked live. So thanks everyone. All right, so I have a question for you all. So is Kubernetes for developers? And what's the ideal level of interaction developers should have with it? Well, I'll start. Um, I think like everything in engineering, it depends. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, uh, and no engineer will give you a straight answer on anything. Now, I think, you know, there's, you know, it's clear that we can do better and provide a higher level of abstraction for a lot of developers where they don't see lots of the nuts and bolts and guts of, of Kubernetes. But not all developers are the same. I think, you know, one of the things that I hit on this morning is that there is this role of platform developer. Their job is to actually create power tools for other application teams to do better. Clearly, those are developers that are going to have to know Kubernetes. Um, and there are some applications that are going to push infrastructure harder than others. And the more advanced your application, the harder it pushes infrastructure, the more you're going to have to know your tools and what's going on underneath it. And so I think it's really a horses for courses type of thing. And I think, you know, one of the, the benefits of Kubernetes is that you can provide the spectrum of experiences on a common base. And, you know, if we do our job right over time, provide ways to actually shift among these things as your needs evolve as you're writing an application. That's interesting, Joe. Um, it's funny that I just tweeted while we were waiting for this, what's a principal engineer? And someone replied, the amount of times they say it depends. So, you know, way to fit the stereotype. But um, I think that whenever we are, we are thinking about um, applications and, and, and developers and deploying to Kubernetes, you know, in an ideal world, we shouldn't, your application shouldn't have to know that they're running in Kubernetes directly. But unfortunately, um, some of the abstractions are a little leaky because, you know, seven years ago, we didn't know all these things. Joe brings up things like how services work, services versus the new gateway idea. Um, I think about things like um, how we mount PVCs and how we expect where things are and like, um, and then also service accounts as well. So I think that you shouldn't have to, but I think as we move on in the future, people are gonna create better abstractions around this idea of separating cloud native from Kubernetes itself. I think that'll be better. But right now you might, but you might also not. I'm not gonna say the other word. It depends. I think um, 
one one like anecdote that I guess I can give. I, I've I've helped deploy Kubernetes in a couple telcos and banks at this point in my life, and I've never seen the answer to this question be the same between organizations. I actually think the question of what's the right level of abstraction to onboard our developers to might be the hardest question, um, perhaps when it comes to setting up Kubernetes. And it can vary a lot. And I think a lot of it is really knowing your audience. Um, you know, as an example, you could give every single development team their own cluster and not worry about abstracting cube at all. And they can handle it themselves and do whatever. But now you're asking all your developers to become subject matter expertise, uh, subject matter experts on Kubernetes. That's overhead, right? But at the same time, your developers have the access to all their knobs and so on that Kubernetes gives them. And then you have on the other side of the spectrum, folks who try to fully abstract Kubernetes. Like they have a mission statement that's like, if developers know they're running on Kubernetes, we've failed. And sometimes the trade-off with that level of abstraction is now when developers need to go in and mess with those knobs, you have this cat and mouse game where you're constantly trying to expose like that under-level detail that you were at one point trying to abstract and it just becomes completely chaotic in and of itself. So hopefully that doesn't sound too pessimistic. I'm just trying to say that it's a really complex problem and there's kind of a spectrum to that. And I think you got to find your place on that spectrum based on knowing your developers and just really knowing your customers more or less and what their needs are. Yeah, yeah I think... I... sorry, go on. I was gonna say, I think that's like a super important way to like look at it. It's not just, oh, hey, everyone, this is exactly what you need to care about. Put back to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we run a multi-tenant cluster for around 400 developers, um, which brings its own um, challenges. Um, I think in some ways we see some great bits of abstraction. The storage and load balancer abstractions are great. We see teams not having to wrestle directly with hardware or even talk to the teams that, pr that provide those services. So that's great. But I do struggle um, with whether giving everyone just, there's kubectl, you've got a namespace, it's all backed up, off you go, do what you want versus the, should we provide some abstraction on top of that? And I think as everybody said, it depends. Out of those 400 developers we've got using our cluster, we have some that would love having root access on it and would want direct access to you know, the innards of XCD if they could. Um, we don't do that. Um, but then we've got developers that really don't care what it's running on. Yeah, I've just got to put some YAML together and I run this pipeline and to die magic happens and I've got code to write, so I'd rather get back to that. And I, I really struggle with this um, um, this idea of cognitive load we're putting on developers as to whether Kubernetes is actually easier than learning all the other bits of infrastructure and how you provision hardware, or whether it's actually another set of stuff to learn, and it's another layer and an even increasing load. And I, I struggle to work out what the right answer is with that. Maybe it's because we've got quite an old cluster that we built from the ground up and we didn't have the options and the abstractions then. And whether we should even be thinking about putting retrospective frameworks and et cetera on it. I'd be interested to hear what, what, what thoughts are of, um, uh, of, of you all on, on uh, whether putting frameworks or real Kubernetes is the right thing to do or a better thing to do and any experiences you've had of that as well. Well, by frameworks, are we talking about like say something like Knative on top of it to really accelerate, you know, and provide a higher level of tools? Is that what you're thinking, Andrew? I'm thinking maybe perhaps um, even a bit more, um, perhaps a bit more container native than maybe like um, um, like a FAS kind of function. Uh, more kind of like I have a container, I just want to run it. Mm. We've got a Kubernetes cluster. Is there a wrapper? Thing, so I don't have to write, you know, I can write four lines of YAML rather than 20. I think, you know, there's this... Go ahead, Brian. I see Joe and Josh thinking, because, you know, this is a problem that, yeah, I think that uh, there's no real solution for this, or there's no real ultimate solution for this. This is the holy grail. This is where people really want to be. I just want to deploy that thing that I built on my desktop. And I wanted to do all the things that I think it should do. Networking, load balancing, you know, resiliency, um, observability. That's where we're going, but you know, we have a we have quite a journey. 
I think for yeah, me, this I'll, is instructive of, oh, go ahead, Josh. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was just gonna say to Brian's point, like I, I've been down this use case before where we got to like four lines of YAML and that's all the dev needed. They put it in and it would just go right in and everything would get wired together. And then what I always come to when we take this approach is then we realize, oh wait, like we need customization here. And then it goes from four lines of YAML to 12 lines of YAML, then 20, then 40, then 60. And it's just, again, this, this cat and mouse abstraction game. And I think that's why this problem is so, so hard to figure out. Um, go ahead, Joe. Now, I was going to say, it reminds me of this old saw when I, you know, I started my career at Microsoft talking about Word. Everybody looked at Word back in the day. They're like, it's so bloated. It has so many features. Nobody uses all these features. And it's true. Nobody uses all of those features. But what you find is that, you know, there's like maybe 20% of the features that everybody uses. And then everybody uses another 20% of all the features, but it's a different set of 20%, right? And so it's, you know, there is no single sort of simplified abstraction that's going to work for everybody. And there's no abstraction that's going to work for everybody over time, right? Because, you know, applications aren't static, they continue to evolve. And so I think, you know, and this comes down to sort of the accidental versus essential complexity. There is some of this stuff that is ex essential complexity. And if you try and remove it, you're just gonna to have to add it back later to meet somebody's need. And in doing so, you may end up recreating the Kubernetes API, but just different. And I think that's the, uh, that's the situation that I think we see play out over time. I mean, maybe there's a better way to actually frame this. Maybe there are some ways to do it. So I think, you know, uh, never say never, but I think we've definitely seen those patterns. I definitely just got word art nostalgia. <laughs> exactly, I don't use word art, but you know there's people who do. I'm looking forward to the Kubernetes Clippy. I'm sure Microsoft's working on it. <laughs> so, um, Joe, you had briefly mentioned Knative. So I actually have a question on K related to Knative. So what do you think will happen with serverless and Knative? There seems to be the potential that it could create yet another layer of abstraction on top of Kubernetes. Is that good? Is that bad? Should we be feeling that? I think this is just the natural way of things. I think we build abstractions and sort of like, you know, your age is somewhat dependent on sort of like what you consider to be a reasonable abstraction. I mean, I started programming in C and C++. I consider assembly language too low, you know, but like there's other people who are like, wow, C and C++ is too low, right? And so I think we just see these things sort of evolve over time. And I think it's totally appropriate to build reusable toolkits that we move on top of. Now, I think the danger here is that if you go with serverless and something in your application doesn't fit those patterns, do you have options? What is your answer then? Do you have to throw everything away? Or is there a way for you to smoothly start mixing in different technologies without having to reset things? And I think that's one of the advantages that we get with Kubernetes with sort of fine-grained interaction between different frameworks or different systems that's running on top of it. I think the um, I think that all these experiments in different ways of describing deployments is interesting. Um, K Native pairs it down, and then you get this facility which can scale based on the load. But something else interesting that came out of the K Native space is this idea of duct typing, where now you can actually match these you can match these objects, these YAML objects, against one another. So you can you can basically have this object that looks like another object and you can use them interchangeably. Um, I think that we need to continue exploring these interfaces because we think back to web development where we had the really bad stuff that was in Java, but that's all we knew. And then actually Ruby on Rails came through in like 2006, 2005, and, we, and we, it changed how we looked at web development. And you can, I can actually see the lineage of Rails in everybody's modern web stacks. So we need people to go out there and the Knative crew went out there and I think that some of the things they've created are gonna change the way that we think about solving the problems in the future. Uh, but I will say that uh, Knative is great. It's Knative serving and Knative inventing is allowing us to think about things in ways where we can build even better abstractions, not even on top, but instead of. So we need it. And I, I encourage you to try it at least once. It is actually pretty neat if you, if you fall into its use case. I still need to try it. I have a shirt, though, with the duck on it, but I still need to try it. Their brand is strong. 
Um, all right. Does anyone else have anything they wanted to say on that, or should I move forward? I I, I wanted to just ask a little bit about the um, reasons for K Native. Um, I think in, in my organisations, if if uh, people are wanting to do any form of functions of a service, they have the option to use Lambda on AWS, and they kind of like that because they know it. It's you know it's been around. I don't know what the developer experience is like now. I know it used to not be great. I haven't looked at it in a while, but we did some evaluation work on serverless frameworks on Kubernetes about two years ago. So it's horrifically out of date now. But one of the things that struck me about Knative was it came with a lot of components that would then require the platform team to support, and maybe some components they weren't necessarily that familiar with. I think like Postgres and there's some other relational database and a few other moving parts. And I just wondered that trade-off between making things simpler and easier for developers to have an easy way to run stuff versus the operational overhead you're then putting back on the platform team. I wonder if anybody had any thoughts on that or um, experience of, of that. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I think, um, you know, it's still an evolving situation with Knative. A lot of those dependencies that um, I think were in the earlier versions of Knative I have, have now been sort of uh, uh, removed or made optional. Um, I think things like Istio is a great example. So they they were pretty, you know, when they first came out, they were pretty locked to Istio for doing any sort of incoming routing. There's now a more generic way of dealing with that, which is uh, which is really good to see. They have more optionality there. Um, I think the question around sort of do that or, or do Lambda, I think, you know, this comes down to a lot of the the questions in terms of, of you know, do you want to actually stay in the Kubernetes world? Do you want to work in your native cloud world? Do you want to actually mix and match these things? And some of this is that I don't think it's a matter of, well, we write our application in Lambda or we write our application in Kubernetes. I think oftentimes it's going to be both. And, you know, where some of my application is, you know, lightweight and it's more re reactive and that may be using um, something like, like you know, a, a serverless architecture and some stuff may be more traditional. And you're going to see those things actually mix and match together. And so that becomes harder when you're actually working across the Kubernetes and native cloud lines, especially when you start looking at security and auth across those things. So keeping everything in a single sort of framework or a single sort of uh, um, infrastructure platform, I think definitely can, can make things a lot easier. So whenever you take on any abstraction, you know, I think you're, you trade the abstraction for um, flexibility, complexity, um, the ability to configure, and we always have to measure where those are. I think there's, um, I think it's worth it in, in cases. Um, I do telco 100%, so none of my telco workloads are gonna run in Knative. Matter of fact, we don't even use it you know, or any of that other stuff either. Um, we just really care about scheduling and, and network connectivity. So just understand that your abstractions, um, the abstractions are not free, so if, if you're not giving up anything that hurts you, um, I suggest you use it. Um, it's it's actually, it's pretty good software and it's very powerful for the amount of work you need to put in. But also realize that by buying that abstraction or using that abstraction, you take on the amount of fle flexibility it doesn't have as well. So it's like everything in computers. Um, I think the only thing you can do is, is do the best jobs that you can with your dev teams to protect yourself from weird deployment environments. And because guess what, it's gonna change. All right, so I have another question. So as you've seen organizations put Kubernetes in place, what are some things they common, commonly neglect or maybe don't even know about at first that they end up learning the hard way? Well, I'll, um, I think one, one pattern that we see is that people go to the, the, the cloud native landscape and they view that as a checklist and they have to feel like they have to use one of everything and they have to take on every single project, every single technology all at once. I think, you know, that is uh, um, not something that they neglect. I think people sometimes get too eager to try and go all in and try and do it all at once. And so I think, you know, one hard lesson is that, you know, start simple, build on that, make sure it's useful and bring in new tools. I think like what Brian was saying, 
these new things come with some overhead, both in terms of operational and cognitive overhead. Make sure that that overhead makes sense to you and it's really solving a problem that you have. A common one that I see is treating Kubernetes like a strategy. Um, so I love Kubernetes to death. I just don't think that it's wise to wake up in the morning and say like, our new strategy is Kubernetes. It's gonna solve our problems. I think you figure out what your strategy and problems are and acknowledge that Kubernetes and the cloud native ecosystem are tools to help you get there. And the reason that I bring this up and I'm somewhat pedantic about it is because you know, it's just really easy to lose sight and like all the, to Joe's point about all these different building blocks and all these different technologies and not really think through like, what's a developer experience we're trying to create? Is Kubernetes even the right technology? Hopefully, um, you know, and, and things like that, that I think are really important foundational things you wanna have defined before you start your journey with Kubernetes. So, um... Interesting that Josh says that um, Kubernetes is not a strategy. Actually, in my talk this morning, I actually said this exact same thing, where Kubernetes is not a strategy; it's a tactic. It's you know, it's it's something on the ground. It's not you know, it's not how we are going to do things. It's what we are doing. Um, but I will say that one of the one of the um, things you need to think about when you move to Kubernetes is uh, networking and storage, and whether it be inside the cluster or outside the cluster. So with Kubernetes CNI, um, Container Networking Interface, is actually it's amazing inside of the cluster. This overlay that you get allows us to basically uh, talk between nodes as if they're all on the same computer. That's amazing. But the problem is, is that um, depends on, it's amazing if, it, if your network requirements. So let's say if you want to get into things where you have complex load balancing. So you want to go um, beyond a level seven load balancer, and let's say you want to load balance using EG, um, ECMP, or you want to do something like um, BGP load balancing, oh, wow, that gets really hard, really fast. And the same thing with storage. Uh, with storage, with, with, um, with CSI, the container storage interface, it's very easy to get started. But now when you get into these more complex modes, now how does it work? And you really do need to think about data locality if it's not set up for you. Like, where is my data? Who can access? It? Is it right? Is it you know? Is it read write once? Is it read write? Is it read only? I don't know. You actually don't have to think about those things now. I think the thing, um, if we had a time machine to go back and do things again, I think the um, the pain point we see at the minute is around right sizing for workloads. I mean, and this isn't a new thing. We've had it with you know physical machines. We've had it with VMs. It's the same problems, but kind of exasperated a little bit more on a multi-tenant cluster. Um, and I don't think we've got the right tooling to help our developers and the people putting together applications to right-size as efficiently as we could do. Um, I spend a lot of my time talking about the difference between requests and limits and the impacts on the cluster and the cost implications. And um, I really think um, if, if I could do something again, I think we'd We'd, we'd, we'd put more effort into that up front. But I don't think there's a solution for it yet. And it's not a new problem. It's um, obviously something, as I say, that's been around for many years. So do what I do every time you run into something like requests or limits, or even better, like um, affinity, anti-affinity. I just blame Joe. It's all Joe's problem. It's all my but, fault, yeah, sure. I'll yeah, it's it. all Joe's <laughs> fault. But something to think about. No, but I think, I mean, it is a hard problem. It really is. Yeah, and and here's the thing. Um, Jay Z has a quote. I couldn't go this whole thing without quoting hip hop. Um, where um, basically, I'm, not, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Uh, but you know what Kubernetes does is it makes the impossible possible, or and it makes the hard things easy. And you know there is no panacea out there for this operations world, or for platforms, or for platforms of platforms. So think of the things that are accessible because of Kubernetes. And think of things that um, we can now build that we could not think about before. Um, Kubernetes bin packing, um, the way CSI and CNI work, um, intercluster communications where you don't even have to worry about that because you're using some kind of gateway service like um, the stuff from Celo or Istio. Um, this is kind of amazing that we can actually think about these problems without having to have all these extreme networking um, experts in the room. We can actually reason through them somewhat. 
you know, somewhat intelligently. Cool. So I, I, as I'm looking at this screen, I keep seeing our like TC shirts. And so Kenny and Ryan were having some questions. So um, with the announcement of Tonto Communication today, how will this help people who are A, new to Kubernetes and B, those who have a few years of Kubernetes experience? Yeah, I can take a first stab. Um, yeah, so starting with the folks who are new to Kubernetes, um, you know, I'll say that we have a really strong aspiration to help in the problem domain of navigating the cloud native landscape, um, something that Joe had talked a little bit about earlier. If you look at the cloud native landscape slide thing, you'll get nauseous and fall over because there's tons of logos for every single thing you could ever imagine. And it's just really hard to not only understand how to choose certain things, but how they fit together to create an end experience for developers. You know, like a fully baked uh, FAS platform and all the different pieces that go into making that possible, like establishing the ingress routes and provisioning the TLS certificates and all those pieces. We want this to be a way where people who are getting into Kubernetes can understand how the building blocks fit together and how you can tightly integrate them and make that reproducible. We're not quite there yet. I think today, Tanzu Community Edition is a little bit more for the former you asked about, Tiffany, the person who has perhaps a few years of experience with Kubernetes. It's a really great way to jump in today, use a packaging model that's going to get you the pieces of the puzzle you need to build application platforms on top of Kubernetes. And it's also gonna provide you with a pretty robust way to declaratively manage cluster lifecycle um, through a technology under the hood called Cluster API. Um, so I think it's, again, really compelling for folks who kind of understand the Kate space pretty well. It's totally something newcomers can use, and I hope over time we'll get it more and more tuned to newcomers. Um, but that's kind of the, the honest assessment of where we're at today. So. Well, I'd you like know, to put another angle on it. Okay, go ahead, Tiffany, sorry. I was gonna say one of the things I think is especially helpful for like newcomers is like if you're like oh hey I need like Start Manager and Contour and Grafana and all these things it's like you have to go here let me go to this doc figure out how to install this here let me go to this one how do I install this versus where with tons of community edition with that whole setup with package management you can just be like okay right, here are these existing packages that are there for you maybe some are already installed or here's some that you can add and be like oh hey I just want to go and include this in my cluster and do it the same way for every single one of them. And hey, look, here's a new namespace and here's all my stuff. Exactly. I think there's another dimension to this that I think is worth looking at, which is um, there's folks who are managing Kubernetes, actually running that infrastructure role, providing the platform, and then there are folks that are using it. Um, TCE has a little bit to offer for both, I think. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that if your goal is to learn how to use Kubernetes, TCE, you know, may not be the best place to start. There's a lot of ways out there to actually, whether it be, you know, on your laptop to something like a kind cluster, or whether it be, you know, using a managed service from a, from a ver various clouds or, or what have you. There's other ways to get, get a Kubernetes cluster that you can work against. If your goal is to dig into what does it look like to run Kubernetes as a production service? That's really what we, you know, what we're starting with 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 uh, Tanzu Community Edition. It's about how do you, you know, and so maybe if you're, you know, if if you're, maybe it's in between. Maybe there's an eight point five here where it's like it's not your first experience with Kubernetes, but you're looking to get this to production. You want something that is really going to grow with you as you continue to to, to develop uh, your expertise around this. That's really what we want TCE to be. It's something that can that can grow up with you, and you know, it's, you you learn patterns based on community stuff that you can use elsewhere. You can continue to use TCE as you continue to grow, or you can you know join us and uh, uh, become a commercial customer of of some of the other Tanzu editions. So yeah, if people didn't see it, go to TanzuCommunityEdition.io and you can start playing around with it, and it's open source and free and make issues, PRs, et cetera, all the fun things. So another question is, if I am switching over from being a traditional ops person to managing containers slash Kubernetes, what are the two or three most important things for me to rethink or to start doing and to stop doing? I, I like this question. 
because this idea of a traditional ops person, you know, when I started in computers, computers, um, ops was, we had modem banks and um, we bootstrapped all our BSDI hosts and our sequent hosts. We didn't know how to do that by hand. And, and I think that, you know, I remember when, um, when, when um, Red Hat actually got to traction, I remember Mandrake Linux, I remember all the other Linuxes, and I remember being a Solaris person and, and AIX and HPUX. And I think, well, that's traditional ops to me. And then we moved into this realm where all the hard problems were had an answer. And, and now we're in this place where now we're, we're doing impossible things that didn't have an answer. So what do you need to do as an, as an ops person? Um, what do you need to start doing? Well, first of all, here's, here's, here's the real talk. Um, know all the layers of the OSI stack. Um, please, please be able to tell me what TCP and IP are. Um, be able to um, describe um, common tools that you would use to be able to manage machine. Um, so if you're on Linux and I'm a modern Linux, know about SS, know about how to look at your networking, know how to look at disk, know how to look at storage know how to troubleshoot a machine. And then when, as you move into the Kubernetes space, what you're gonna find is that a lot of these things are an extension of your previous knowledge that you learned when you were a more traditional admin. But here's some things that you're gonna stop doing. Uh, admins are notorious, and yes, I'm generalizing here, but I have the mic and I can't hear any of the naysayers right now for telling all the reasons why they can't automate something. Um, with, with, when you're moving into this cloud native slash Kubernetes space, look for ways to automate, look for ways to generate, look for ways to repeat, look for ways to capture, know what you actually deployed. Because when you have declarative APIs, guess what you can do? You can actually capture the state of the whole system in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in Git, and then now you have GitOps, somewhat. Um, but these are the things that you need to learn. So take all those old lessons, um, and then apply them to new, and then realize that this new world with this declarative management is actually gonna be more amazing. So let's take advantage of it. Don't bring your old um, lazy sysadmin ways, because we've all been there, into this new space. If someone think, hasn't I mean, heard of GitOps before, what, how would you describe that? I'm gonna let Joe describe it. He'll do a better <laughs> job than I will. Sure, I mean, so GitOps, I think um, the core of GitOps and, and this is actually, you know, one of the things that that I think is part of this transition is that um, we move from a so so of a lot of traditional sysadmin is that the system of record of what should be running is what's running, right? It's like you have somebody, you know, requisitioned a VM at some point, they installed a bunch of software on there, and it's running. And I think, you know, we've all had that machine under the desk that's running something, and we're afraid to turn it off because we're not sure what's on it. Cloud and virtual machines in general have really sort of weaponized that. We've made it really easy to create lots and lots of these machines where you're like, I don't know what's running on that, but I'm afraid to turn it off, right? And so now there's this whole industry around inventorying systems where you grovel around trying to figure out what's running on all these machines. And that's because the system of record of what should be running is what's running. Um, it's just sort of a bit of a tautology there. Uh, what you can do with some of these cloud native, and I think GitOps is part of this movement, is you're sort of, you're, you're inverting the picture. Instead of having an inventory derived from what's actually running, instead what you have is a set of manifests, I'm using that word here, but essentially a description of what should be running. And then you make sure that the things are running are reflecting that. And that way, if there's something that's running that's not lined up with what is in your sort of prescribed, this is what should be running, that's a problem. You either fix it, or it could be a sign that you have some sort of compromise because there's something running in your data center that shouldn't be running and you have an auditable, trackable system of record of what should be there. Now, Git is one way to store that. And I think the idea with GitOps is that you use Git because source control has a lot of these capabilities. There's workflows for changes. There's a permission models on it. It's back upable. And you know, there's an audit trail, all great things when you're trying to manage infrastructure. You take that, and then you apply that to your infrastructure uh, automatically. Um, but you know that you can still get a lot of those benefits even if you're not using Git, if you're using other systems as sort of an external system of record. But in general, I think a big part of this shift from thinking about sort of a traditional ops type of role to you know, something that's more cloud native-y is you know, there's concepts around 
declarative infrastructure, immutable infrastructure, this idea of you want to be very crisp about what should be running versus just going in and SSHing in something and configuring it. Um, a big part of that whole idea of platform as product producing this experience for users is about giving them some predictability there and having this clear sort of like, here's what we describe, here's what's running, uh, ends up really facilitating that also. And then finally, this really gets you towards the, the whole uh, pets versus cattle mentality. Uh, there's this idea that as you move to cloud, as you move to replicatable things, you want to make sure that what you're doing is, is reproducible and clonable versus having be sort of special cases. So pets would be special cases, whereas cattle are things that are, are relatively uh, uh, stamp outable. You can actually generate them on the fly and, and you have a replicati replicatable way of reproducing those results. So all of that, th those are really going to a mindset shift as you move over from one of these worlds to the other. Told you so. <laughs> And I totally interrupted. So someone else started talking at the point where I asked that question. Do you remember what you were asking? We're going to say. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Whoops. So, like, I feel like because it is in the title, even though we like sort of know part of the answer to it, but like, so Kubernetes, whose idea was this? And like, where did the idea for Kubernetes come from? So I'll, let me say something. Kubernetes, we used to do it in the park after dark. And for any hip hop people, you're going to get that. And you're going to tweet at me later. And you're going to be like, that was amazing, Brian. But um, I'll let Joe answer this one because he was there. Uh, I mean, anything like Kubernetes, and I think this is just an example of anything across our industry. It doesn't show up out of whole cloth. There are always tons of influences, tons of things that actually lead into it. So I thought this was where Brian was going, and I'm not sure I get the hip hop reference because I'm just too old and white. But um, yeah, um, the you know the the reality is is that is that so many of these ideas that go into Kubernetes had been gestating for so long in different areas, right? So I think we look at a lot of the the sort of the Netflix open source stack and the way that they were using. Uh, uh, AWS early on, I mean, because that's, you know, all that AWS talked about for about 10 years, right? Um, this was, you know, th some of those patterns were clearly cloud native. Uh, the ideas around containers, there was a lot of history there. Docker really crystallized that into something that was useful. Uh, the declarative infrastructure stuff, you look at things like Puppet and Chef and Salt and Ansible, and there's definitely the seeds of sort of declarative, this is what I want type of thing. But this idea of taking containers, combining it with declarative, running it continuously versus one shot, because like there are everybody at some point is like, I'll just run puppet every five minutes and I'll be done. Right. Like taking those things, you know, the 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 container image format and the experience from Docker, bringing all these things together was honestly just kind of a point in time type of thing where it's like there was these soup of ideas and we brought those together. And I think. The advantage that we had being at Google is that we had a system, the precursor system in Borg, that was similar enough that we could actually see a little bit into sort of how we thought all this stuff was going to play out. And so we had a little bit of a head start in terms of that point of view. But the, the, the reality is, is that, you know, it was really about combining all these ideas, all these technologies from all these different directions. And I'd love to know from other folks, like, what are some other things that you think are like, you know, precursors or inputs or things that are obvious to you influence Kubernetes? Because some of this stuff, I think, even when we were starting it, kind of happened unconsciously, right? It's just sort of you soak in all of this being in the industry. I, I saw a parallel with Hadoop. So I spent a few years working with Hadoop clusters, which are big, big pieces of tin. So I think we were 32 cores and a quarter of a terabyte of RAM across like 60 different machines running very large workloads that crunched uh, data overnight. And okay, it was batch processing. But the way in which you could see things like MapReduce work, where it would break the workloads down into schedulable units of work and it would run it across the cluster on different nodes in the cluster and there was resilience there. So if part of that failed, it would run it again, not necessarily on the same node. 
I could see great parallels when I came to start working with Kubernetes in some of that clustered, distributed um, ways of thinking about running compute. And I could see that as a, as a, as a um, uh, maybe not an influence, but certainly a tried and trusted way of running distributed workloads. So I'm going to throw two names out there. Actually, I'll throw three. Um, one is pre or one is post Kubernetes. Other is two pre Kubernetes. Um, so you have Jeff Lindsay. Um, I don't know if you all know who he is. And then you have Adam Jacobson. Um, you know these ideas. These are the people that created these ideas. And then there's Alexis Richardson, uh, who we talked about a little bit for GitOps. But um, Jeff Lindsay created the concept of webhooks, or actually he named it. He's the person that is named for creating webhooks. You know, some of these things that we take for granted now for like how um, Kubernetes does um, uh, admission controllers and webhooks, there's like all these complex distributed systems use webhooks now. And then you have Adam Jacobson, who um, Joe mentioned earlier about Chef. And it's funny, I'm actually wearing a Chef t-shirt today. Um, that whole declarative pattern. So if you, if you look back at CF Engine and what they did back in the 90s, and then you look at what Puppet actually said, well, Ruby's an actually, it's not the greatest language, but it's flexible and, and you can do some things with it. And then Puppet, I mean, and Chef saw it as, well, hold on, everything's an object in Ruby. So let's actually use the DSLs we create in Ruby to create this neat declarative things. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why YAML is so pervasive right now, because it looked like those amazing things that we were able to use. So just keep in mind that there's so many there's so many products out there and projects that you might have not even heard of or these founders or, or these project creators that basically, like Joe said, they, um, it took us you know, 25 years, I would say, to, of, of just continual um, progress to get us in a place where, oh, wow, um, Kubernetes is interesting. And then I'll give one last one, um, Mesos and Marathon. Now, Marathon actually showed a good pattern for being able to run applications and not having to worry about what they were being deployed on. Um, the problem with Mesos ultimately is that it had two schedulers and no one really could get around that. But just think that there's the projects you are working on right now could be actually be the inspiration for the spiritual su successor of Kubernetes. Or maybe not, maybe it just makes Kubernetes better in the future. Just think about it that way. We all share the ideas. My precursor is not as interesting, but the one that always comes to mind for me is just the move between mutable and immutable infrastructure. Like, even though we had things like Ansible and, you know, these configuration management tools, I feel like I spent the first, like, three years of my career constantly chasing down where a Java heap size parameter got changed on an app server somewhere and who changed it and what changed it and how it mutated. And it's just, like, crazy to, like, think about this progression of, like, the cattle model we're in today where like so many pieces of the stack from like the host machine image to the containers to like all these things, we're like trying to set them up so that they can just be destroyed at will. And then ideally just reconcile back to how we wanted them to be anyways, which is like, you know, at the time would have sounded extremely, extremely novel. And I feel like today I, I sort of take it for granted um, in, in the space that we live in, you know? Yeah, that dash XMX is, um, that's a killer. Always a Not killer. Fun. So Simone has a question. So what are the big new features that got released this year in Kubernetes and what's coming in 2022? Crazy, it's almost 2022 and only a few more months. I'm trying to remember sort of what the new features are. Things are slowing down and I think this is kind of always the plan, right? We wanna make sure that we focus on extensibility so that people can extend Kubernetes and add stuff on the outside without waiting for sort of the main Kubernetes release train, just because that you know, ends up taking so long to get deployed and it, it creates a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of friction. So I think you know, the big thing clearly is, you know, there is like things like deprecations of, um, of um, security uh, uh, policies um, uh, was the big one, you know, that's definitely big, but I think we're definitely seeing a lot of these extensibility features being added. On security policies, PSPs, sorry, <laughs> blank there for a second. <laughs> it's really hard to disassociate this year from last year. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, so 
Um, actually, something interesting, and I don't know when it came up, but um, Joe mentioned this before too. It's it's actually a big it's a big deal. Um, this idea of this gateway interface that's coming to Kubernetes that's being worked on right now. Actually, I love that one. Um, we, we went through um, the whole ingress, and you know we had things working with ingress, and then actually when we were at Heptio, uh, we started the contour project, and we continued along here. It made things easier. But now I don't really want to care what's backing it. I just want a gateway. I just want to have traffic that is outside of my cluster get inside of my cluster. And I think that that's actually, that's pretty exciting for me. Okay, so finger in the wind and tell me if I'm totally crazy here. But I think like the idea of like really honing in on the Kubernetes API and the idea of CRDs and like providing models where we can focus on that and then rip out some of the internal guts for more purpose-based applications. Um, like, I'm not saying that KCP is the example of this, but like the KCP project is a really interesting thing where it kind of strips down a lot of things and provides you with this more minimal integrated API server at CD style setup. And the idea is that you bring CRDs into it and then you can like bring arbitrary controllers to act on those CRDs. I think for like edge use case and stuff, there could be some like really interesting things there. So um, again, I have no data to back this up, but that, that'd be a really interesting space to see Kubernetes go in 2022. Sweet. I don't really want new features. We should sing this better, shouldn't we? Sorry. <laughs> go on, Brian. Oh no, I was actually, I my, I don't think I meant to say that out loud. This is, yeah, this is why I should be on video. But um, one thing that I think that I would like to see is Kubernetes running in more, more, more places. So we have this data center model. Um, I actually, because I do telco, I actually focus on edge 100%. And it's not just edge at your store, it's edge somewhere else. So that's kind of neat. So Andrew, I want to hear. Well, so you said you don't want to see new features. What do you want to see? What do you think needs? What are the well, problems that in in the, the the things that you're facing? I I just want dull stuff. I want more reliability. I want stuff to work a little bit quicker. I'm not too interested in the new shiny because that will be released in an alpha feature and then it'll get it'll bubble up. So yeah, I I, I want the dull stuff. I I just I just want better reliable dull, dull, dull things. Yeah, uh, and, Craig, uh, my, my co-founder at Heptio at one point said, we got we to gotta nail the staples. <laughs> so that's what we got to do, we got to nail the staples. Speaking of nailing staples, um, this comes to the end of the panels. Thank you all for joining and sticking around with me and answering questions for the last about an hour or so. Um, thanks everyone for attending all the talks thus far. The conference is not over. You should stick around for a DevOps party games and go over to that. There, we are also asking if you have the time after to give some feedback via the survey. You can find that in the announcement Slack channel and it'll be sent in an email. All the recordings will be out on devopsloop.io on October 6th. And one more thing about Tanzi Queen Edition, it, there is a channel in the Kubernetes Slack if you want to come talk more about it there. So thanks everyone and go to DevOps Party Games. And again, VMworld, it's the rest of this week. <laughs>